Well, we're going to jump right into our sermon series on the Beatitudes. This morning, we're looking at our seventh of eight Beatitudes. These are blessings that Jesus himself gives the kingdom of God at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So this morning's blessing or Beatitude, it's short and sweet. It's the seventh of the eighth, and Jesus says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Okay, so this morning, uh, I'm going to channel, I'm almost going to sound like a Miss America pageant, just saying the solution to all the world's problems is world peace. It might sound a little hippie, but this is from the very words of Jesus himself. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we're going to talk about making peace. And the reality is, if you think about it, we live in a world that lacks peace. Point number one would be this, is we are in a world that is without peace. Now, very often when we think about that, the opposite of peace, you would probably say what? It's conflict. An antonym for peace would be conflict. And, and the epitome of conflict would be war, right? I mean, think about war, what war is. War is defined this way. It's any conflict that claims the lives of over 1,000 people. Now, have you ever stopped and thought about this? Okay. Uh, how many wars have there been in human history? Did you know this? Historians have actually tried to answer this question, and to the best of their ability, they've said this. There's about 3,400 years of human history, and of those 3,400 years, we have only had world peace for 268 years. Now, some of you who like percentages, who are trying to do the math, here it is. For 8% of human history, our world has been without war. In fact, just in the 20th century, over 100 million humans lost their lives in war. And this was especially true in Jesus' day and age. When you think about the ancient Near East, the part of the world, the century that Jesus existed in, it was marked by hostility, it was marked by conflict and turf war. There was wars going on all the time. People were consistently competing over resources. There was racial and ethnic tension. There was misunderstandings. There was empires that were greedy and imperialistic. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, Ben, that was then and this is now. I don't live in the ancient Near East. That was back in the past. It's the 21st century. I'm an American, and we're experiencing unprecedented peace. Don't bring up this topic of war. We're living in a peaceful day and age. And I would just ask you, okay, are we really experiencing peace in our day and age? When you think about, you know, going to a t-ball game in the ball field, are they marked by peace? When you think about, uh, you know, the, the, the break room that you hang out with your coworkers, the hallways that you talk with your, your classmates, are those conversations marked by peace? When you get on Twitter and Facebook, are those conversations marked by peace? No, the reality is these locations, these environments are marked by division and hostility and conflict. So what's going on here? Why do we live in a world that lacks peace? Why is this peace so hard to attain in our day and age? Well, the Bible actually answers that question. James, who was a wisdom author, says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. See, we live in a day and age that would say war is past. It's in the past. You know, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the World Wars, those are outdated. Those are antiquated. Those are things of the past. As Americans, we tend to think that war, conflict, that's, that's for people in other parts of the world. The Middle East. Africa, Asia, Vietnam, the war on terror, that happens in different parts of the world. But do you see what James is saying? He's saying, though, when you think about conflict, when you think about war, it's present. It's not past. It's persistent. It's with us each and every day, and it's personal. James is saying that there's a war going inside, on inside each and every one of us with our sinful attitudes, desires, and our passions. James likes to give it to you straight. He's honest. He's blunt, and he says, here's the harsh reality. We tend to think that conflict is out there, it's in the world, but James says, no, our sin, it's in here, it's in our very own hearts. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Ben, 
you gave me that great statistic and you said there actually 8% of human history there was peace. Well, what about that 8%? Well, I'm glad you asked. Did you know the Bible actually describes a time in human history where there was peace in the absence of war? You would find that in the very beginning of the Bible. There's two chapters, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And this is the creation account. You probably know this pretty well, but each and every day God creates something. He speaks it into existence by his word. He creates the universe. He creates the sun. He creates the stars, animals, plants, fish, birds. And yet at the end of every day of creation, God pronounces a blessing. What does he say? It is what? It's good. Now, when God says good, he doesn't mean average. He doesn't mean mediocre like your fast food burger. It's pretty good. That's not what he's saying. See, when God uses the word good, the actual word in the original language is shalom. And the word shalom, it means peace. It means harmony. It means blessing. And here's what you got to understand about shalom. Shalom is not simply the absence of conflict or the absence of war or hostility or violence or hate. Shalom is actually the presence of something. It's the presence of justice and equity and wholeness, and peace. And so here's what we find in the very beginning of the Bible. The first page of our Holy Scripture is that God created everything in harmony. We're in harmony with God. We're in harmony with each other. We're in harmony with creation. We're even in harmony with ourselves. But guess what? How long does this harmony last? Anybody want to guess? Not very long. Because in Genesis 3... Right? Theologians would call this the fall. The fall. And the fall is the moment where Adam and Eve disobey God and humanity falls from glory. In other words, peace, shalom, harmony, it's shattered. And guess what? I might not know you personally. I might not know everything about your life. But guess what? I know the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And the worst things that's ever happened to me. And you, you want to know what it was? It was the fall. It was the fall because peace was shattered. And so every conflict that we experience today, and it might be in the headlines of the news, the genocides, the racial tensions, the assaults, every conflict that we experience personally, the divorce, the shouting matches, the misunderstandings, every conflict that we experience is a consequence of this moment in history. See, the fall had damaging and lasting effects on everyone and everything. And today, things are not as they should be. So what do we do do about it? we got to pursue peace. Y'all with me? we got to pursue peace. We live in a world without peace, so we should pursue peace. So point number two is, how do we pursue peace? And the world gives us an alternative. And I would call this cheap peace. This is the world's way. Now let let me just take one moment, very quickly, to get a little deep. You you guys know me, I can't get too deep, but I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try my best to be somewhat philosophical for the professors uh, in the room. But, but there's a real inconsistency in our culture today because our world would say this, okay? We live in a culture or a society that's described as relativistic, okay? So there's my big philosophical world, word. And, and here's what it means to be relativistic. It's this idea that all beliefs are valid. All beliefs are equal. Here's how you hear it in our culture. You do you, man. So you believe what you want to believe, I be- believe what I believe, and let's all get alone, get along. Because belief, worldview, truth, it's personal, right? So just as long as you're not hurting anybody, I'm glad you believe it. Just believe what you want to believe, and it will all work out. But do you see what this is? This is peace at the expense of what? Of truth. This is peace at any cost, and it discards or it removes truth. And at the same time, and this is the inconsistency of our culture, we live in a relativistic age, but we also, you ever heard this phrase, cancel culture? Okay, cancel culture. And we have lost the ability to disagree. There's no such thing as civil discourse on Fox News or MSNBC in Washington, D.C. or on Facebook. We've lost the ability to disagree. And there are certain topics and issues, especially in our day and age, that are no longer culturally acceptable, that the Bible would advocate. Uh, This usually falls along the lines of sex and gender. And so if you want to have a discussion or debate on campus, online, or eyeball to eyeball, okay, 
we're silenced, we're canceled if we disagree with the prevailing view of our culture. So do you see what this is? This is peace as long as you don't disagree with me. Okay, so do you see how our culture is confused? On the one hand, they say peace at any cost, but on the other hand, peace as long as you agree with me. Okay, let's get back in. So there's a lot of ways that I could take this sermon, but what we're really gonna hone in on is we're gonna talk about interpersonal peace or how to deal with conflict with other people. And this could be your brother, your sister, your coworker, your friend, your fraternity brother, okay, your teammate. And, and a lot of the content I'm going to pass on comes from a book called Peacemaking, or The Peacemaker. Uh, this is a book that came out, I think, early 2000s. The author is Ken Sandy. So if there's anything insightful, uh, intellectual, it's not original. It all comes from this book, okay? But, but Ken Sandy says this. There's a spectrum when it comes to peacekeeping. And you can see on one side of the spectrum, there's escape responses. You ever heard the expression, fight or flight? He's using similar language. And he says, most people are peace fakers. When there's conflict, they escape. Okay, and it starts in subtle ways, just with denial. We pretend there's no conflict. And then it moves to flight. And when we flee, when we flight, we flee from the problem. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. You, you, you see this in our society, no-fault divorce. Instead of dealing with the conflict of my spouse, I just escape. I get out of it. Sometimes it's substance abuse. I want to numb myself through drugs and alcohol. Other times we just binge on video games and Netflix because I don't want to deal with this. These are all flight responses. Now, the most extreme flight or escape response would be suicide. And then we see the opposite side of the spectrum. These are attack responses. This is called peace breaking as opposed to peace faking. It could start with assault. This could be physical or verbal. Sometimes we verbally assault people through shouting matches, through gossip, through slander. Uh, this could take legal action through litigation. So instead of using biblical methods that we're going to discuss this morning, we go straight to the courtroom. And once again, the most aggressive, extreme form of peace breaking, it would be murder. But here's what I want you to see, okay? is that our inability to deal with conflict, okay, it is devastating the mission of the church and the family. These are the two institutions that God creates and gives us, the church and the family, and our inability to deal with conflict, to make peace, is destroying these things. I'll give you two quotes right here. Um, let's go to the next slide. It says this, when you think about the mission of the church, it's to make disciples of all nations. Have you ever wondered this? We send missionaries out to different parts of the world to take the gospel. Have you ever wondered, why do missionaries come back? Why do they leave the field? What demoralizes them? What takes them off the front lines? Is, is it the hostility of the people they're talking to? Is it the challenge of the mission? Well, here's the facts. It says this. In fact, towards the end of the 20th century, the World Evangelical Alliance released a significant study that found conflict with peers, it's people within their team, as the top reasons that North American missionaries leave the mission field. Why do missionaries leave the mission field? Because they can't get along with other missionaries. We think about marriage. This is a quote uh, from a professor I had who has spent a long time studying conflict in marriage. He says this, the way that couples react in conflict are predictors of divorce. So here's what we're going to see, brothers and sisters. The goal was not to have no conflict, but to learn how to deal with conflict in a healthy way. So this is probably not the sermon, you know, where I'm going to get fired up and passionate. And you're going to get a lot of, hey, you know, amens and hallelujahs, okay? But y'all can give me some if you want, okay? I need that. That was your chance. There it is. But this is definitely the sermon where you need to break your pen out. You need to take notes. This could be instructive. This could be beneficial. Remember, it's not my wisdom, okay? This is scripture. This is coming from a book. But this could save a relationship, a friendship, a marriage, a relationship one day. So if we shouldn't flee, if we shouldn't fight, if we shouldn't escape, we shouldn't attack, how do we deal with conflict in a healthy way? What is the way of peacemaking? I'm going to give you four G's. I'm going to give you four G's, and we're going to fly through this. The four G's of peacemaking are this. Number one, we've got to glorify God. We've got to glorify God. See, very often in moments of conflict, we tend to think about ourselves, how my feelings were, was hurt, 
how my reputation was diminished, um, how I was offended. But every time we're in conflict, we actually have an opportunity to please and honor God in this situation. Have you ever thought about this? God's glory and Jesus' reputation depend on peace in the body of Christ. Don't believe me? Let me prove it. Give you a couple verses. John 17, 23, Jesus says, I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and you love them just as you loved me. So how does the world know that God sent Jesus to the world? It's demonstrated by the oneness of the body of Christ. Next verse, John 13, 35, Jesus says once again, by this, all people know that you're my disciples. Now fill in the blank. Is it by our doctrinal clarity? Is it by the passion of our worship? The size of our sanctuary? No, it's our love for one another. It's how we demonstrate that we're followers of Jesus. And then finally, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 23, Jesus gives this instruction. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Now, when we think about glorifying God, the moments that bring most glory to God, our creator, we tend to think about Sunday worship, right? Because we're praying, we're singing, uh, we're listening to a sermon, we're jotting down notes, we're receiving the benediction. This is when we tend to think we most glorify God. But do you understand what Jesus himself is saying? He says, don't participate in formal worship until you've what? You've been reconciled with your brothers and sisters in Christ. When Jesus says offering a gift at the altar, he's describing Sunday worship. The Lord's Supper, communion, making a gift, your tithes and offerings. And he's saying, first and foremost, if you recognize during Sunday worship, and you notice he uses family language that someone has something against you, that they've offended you or you've offended them. First, go and pursue reconciliation. Peace and unity precede Sunday worship. Now, here's the good news. Guess what we're celebrating next week? KCP, on the first Sunday of every month, we participate in the Lord's Supper. And so, brothers and sisters, listen to me. We're the family of God. Are you willing to take Jesus at his word? I'd be willing to bet as I read this passage, some of you had a particular person, conversation, or situation come to mind. And do you see what Jesus is calling you to do? He's saying, after this service, get your phone out. Pull somebody aside. Be reconciled before you participate in the Lord's Supper. There's a sense where KCP, if we're serious about Jesus and his prescription, we should go pursue reconciliation before we come back and worship next Sunday. So number one, we glorify God. Number two, starts with a G, we got to get the log out. Get the log out. This is found in Matthew 7. Jesus says, why do, you, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck of your brother's eye. So, first and foremost, we've got to glorify God. Number two, we've got to get the log out. So we're thinking, when it comes to conflict, we're dealing with sin. Does that make sense? We're dealing with sin. So whose sin do we deal with first? Very often we think the other person, the offender, right? I challenge them. I rebuke them. I call them to the map, but do you see what Jesus is saying? Yeah, we've got to deal with sin, but where do you start? You start with your own sin. And the picture that Jesus is painting is of two brothers, and one of them has a log in their eye. They think like a four by four. This is like a railroad tie, and the other person has a speck. That's like a piece of sawdust. It's a splinter. It's a toothpick. And this one person, before he can approach, rebuke, challenge his brother, what does he have to do first and foremost? He's got to do log therapy. He's got to remove the log. And so just think about it. We definitely got to deal with sin, but we deal with our own sin first. We've got to recognize that we all have blind spots. We can all overreact and be overly sensitive. And anytime you have a log in your eye, just think about it. You get an eyelash in your eye and you can barely see straight. 
Imagine having a log in your eye. It's going to impair your sight. It's going to jack up your vision. So if I'm going to see this situation clearly, i got to deal with the log. But it also humbles me. Like I said, in every relationship you have, there's going to be some level of conflict. And if you don't deal with the log, you're going to come in with pride and superiority. And so the first thing you got to do is you got to humble yourself. So, so this is like, this is consistent with just about every relationship that I have. Like I, I am consistently late and forgetful, okay? I lose things all the time, okay? Keys, okay, belts, shoes, it just happens all the time. But I tend to get frustrated when people show up late, you know, to meetings with me or when people forget things, okay? And so first and foremost, what do you got to do? You got to remind yourself, I'm forgetful. I show up late. So instead of going into the situation saying, you did this, you were wrong, do you see how that changes your perception? You tend to say this, hey, I struggle with the same thing. I'm weak in the exact same area. And sometimes when you do log therapy, you come to realize, I just need to overlook this offense. Proverbs 19.11, I'm going to share a couple Proverbs with you. This is wisdom literature. Proverbs 19.11, great memory verse right here. It says, it is to man's glory to overlook an offense. And here's what this doesn't mean. It it doesn't mean you build a case against somebody. It doesn't mean you save that sin for later. It means you extend them forgiveness. Because sometimes when when you're doing log therapy, you recognize that this person made a mistake, but it's not a character issue. Or maybe this person is just really stressed out from work. Or they haven't been sleeping because they have a newborn baby. And I just extend them grace and mercy. I overlook the offense. Okay? So number one, first G, we glorify God. Number two, we deal with our own sin. We get the log out. Number three, we gently restore. G3, we gently restore. This comes from Galatians 6.1. It says this, if your brother, notice once again, family language. If your brother is caught in sin, you who are spiritual, that doesn't mean extremely wise, super spiritual. It means if you possess the Holy Spirit. So Paul's talking to followers of Jesus. He says, you who are spiritual should restore them with the spirit of gentleness. So Paul was saying if you're caught in sin, another word would be entangled. Have you ever like stepped in something or you got something stuck in your shoe and you just can't get rid of it? Last night we're at a wedding and this young lady, she came out of the bathroom and guess what was stuck to her high heel? Okay, a little bit of toilet paper. So I got to put into practice Galatians 6.1 in a very discreet, subtle way. I said, hey, you got some toilet paper on your shoe. She tried to do a little shimmy, a little shake, and she couldn't get rid of it. She was entangled. She was caught in toilet paper. So what did I do? Not in a spirit of condemnation. I didn't ridicule her. I didn't make a public scene. But, but I just said, I wanted to restore her. I just put my foot on it, and I dragged it away. Okay? It's Galatians 6.1. So the goal is restoration, not condemnation. Gentleness, we restore them gently. Uh, Jesus gives us some really practical instruction in Matthew 18. He says this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two others along with you. Then every charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That would be almost like a non-believer. So this is a classic passage on what we would call church discipline. Now let me give you a few thoughts about this passage in Matthew 18. First off, if you read the section right before, verse 15, Jesus gives us a parable. It's the parable of the lost sheep. And so the first thing we've got to rem- remember if we're going to restore somebody is that we're all sheep and we're all messy. And then immediately after this instruction, Jesus gives another parable, and it's the parable of the unforgiving servant. And once again, Jesus is reminding us that we've all been forgiven much. So why do we go to our brothers? Well, sometimes we go to them and we realize that we're just clarifying a misunderstanding. Other times we go to our brother and sister and we learn that we were actually wrong. Sometimes we go to them and we deliver them from the poison of unforgiveness or bitterness. Well, when do we go to our brothers? When do we go to our sisters? 
When your sin reaches a point where it's too serious to overlook, okay? When it's too serious to overlook. Now, I know you guys know that Pastor Andrew's on sabbatical. You probably miss him because you got to hear preaching from guys like me, okay? But just in honor of Pastor Andrew, I'm going to re- repeat his favorite word, significant, okay? Y'all with me? Significant. So if you're in a situation or relationship where there is significant dishonor to God, where the relationship is significantly damaged, where they are significantly hurting themselves or hurting other people, that's when you need to go to them. That's when you need to confront. Well, if that's when we do it, well, how do we do it? Once again, let's just apply scripture. Colossians 4, 6 says this, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt. Ephesians 4, 29 says, um, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for building others up according to their needs. So that's how we do it. Now, do you notice, who does Jesus say we should go to? We should go to who? Oh, the screen is blank. Okay, let's see how good your memory is. Does it say go to the message boards? Does it say go to Facebook? Does it say go to your email? Now, I recognize Jesus didn't have a smartphone. He didn't have Google. Okay, but he says go to the person. He says be direct, not indirect. So often we go to text message, we go to emails, we go to online forums, or we go to other people. You know what that is, that is called? That's called gossip. It's called gossip. Believe it or not, all right, one of the primary places that gossip occurs is at prayer meetings. Because here's how it happens. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so and their family? Did you hear about this person's job? Did you hear about this person's kid or this person's marriage? And we, at length, we describe the hostility and the conflict. At the very end, to spiritualize it, we, should, we say what? Hey, we should pray for them. Okay? Gossip is when we say the right things to the wrong people. You see that? We say truthful things to the wrong people. And Jesus is saying, you got to go directly to the person. Give you another proverb. Proverbs 20, 19 says this, a gossip betrays confidence. So avoid anyone who talks too much. So very often I'm in situations just in my role where people come to me with a certain conflict. And you want to know what I ask them? Because I want to live and abide and obey Proverbs 20, 19, I say this, have you gone to the person? You're talking to the wrong person. Have you gone to the person? Oh, you haven't? Would you like me to go with you? We need to avoid gossip. And so Jesus says, go to the person. And when you go, you don't judge their motives. We're not all knowing. And so when I approach them, I do it in humility because I've done my log therapy. And I say, look, I could be wrong. Here's what I've observed. And look, I don't know your heart, but I'm coming to you because if I was in this situation, I'd want you to come to me. And then we listen. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, to answer before listening is folly and shame. So, let's move on to our fourth G. We glorify God. Verse number two, we get the log out. Third, we gently restore. And then number four, we go and we be reconciled. Go and be reconciled. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now in the past, I've talked extensively about forgiveness when we talked about mercy and God being merciful. But just to recap, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not primarily emotion. Forgiveness is a decision. But it's not a one-time decision. It's a decision we make each and every day where we recognize the offense And we show grace, we show mercy, and it's a future promise. And so when we forgive somebody, here's the promise we make. I'm not going to dwell on this incident. I'm not going to use this against you. I'm not going to talk to others about this incident behind your back. And I'm not going to allow this to hinder our relationship. Now let me just summarize, wrap up with a couple tips on peacekeeping, peacemaking. But you notice this, Jesus is describing a process. And he's saying, as best as you can, keep it as private as possible, as long as possible. And as the offense increases, progressively, you include more people, two or three, and then the entire church. So there may come a time where you have to involve other people. But don't just involve anybody. Find one person, two or three people, who are spiritually mature, 
They're wise, they're discerning, they can keep a secret, and they're unbiased. And very often we do need to bring in other people to mediate, to ask questions, to clarify, and to counsel by God's word. And in certain situations, do you see this? Jesus says there are certain occasions where you have to tell it to the church. And this is the beauty of our church. We have a group of men who are called elders, and they have authority over the members and their conduct in this church. And unfortunately, there are situations where even members of this church persist in unrepentant sin. And Jesus instructs us to tell it to the church, and then we have to treat them as a non-believer. Now, what in the world does that mean? That sounds really harsh, demeaning, cold, and unloving. Well, notice what Jesus says. He, treat, he says, treat them as an unbeliever. So unfortunately, this has happened in the past year where all our elders have said, okay, in, in certain situations there are people that we are treating as unbelievers. We're saying, look, we don't know their heart. We're not omniscient. But at this point in their journey, all right, they, they, are not, they are living lives of unrepentant sin. And so it says, as an unbeliever. This is a functional decision that we make based on their demonstrated behavior. And you might say, well, what does that mean? How do we treat them? Well, how did Jesus treat non-believers? How did Jesus treat unbelievers? He loved them, but he also told them the truth. So that's our responsibility. One final thought. We are called to forgive everyone. Okay, but that doesn't mean we'll be reconciled with everyone. In fact, in Romans 12, Paul says this, make every effort, or he says, as far as it depends on me, make every effort to live at peace with all of mankind. So there are certain situations, okay, maybe in a situation where there's extreme harm or there's abuse, where you don't need to be reconciled with somebody. You don't need to be in a relationship with that person. You need to extend them forgiveness, okay, but you can't always be reconciled with people. There are difficult people, unreasonable people, and you can text them, you can call them, you can initiate conversations, you can do everything you can. You make every effort, but it no longer depends on you, okay? This doesn't mean we'll be restored with everybody, and there actually are certain situations that can be abusive, detrimental, even dangerous, where we don't need to be restored to them, okay? So... Is, it, is what I'm saying, if we can just practice the four G's, we can usher in a perfect peace in our church and in Carrollton, Georgia? No. So final point is this. Let's look at the peacemaker. Let's look at the peacemaker. I think you guys know where I'm going. But even with the four G's, we still fall short. There's still the absence of perfect peace. But here's the good news. Colossians 1 says this. For in Jesus... The fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, Jesus making peace by the blood of his cross. As we wrap up, I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about the context of scripture. This is the ancient Near East. How did people try to bring about peace in the ancient Near East? It was through the sword. Generals, emperors, commanders, might made right. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, and he has the audacity to say, I'm the prince of peace. I'm the peacemaker. And think about this. It says right here that Jesus makes peace by the blood of the cross. As Jesus approaches the cross, he neither fought, there was no fight, and there was no flight. But his disciples did. Remember, right before the cross, what does Peter decide to do? He picks up the sword, and he swings it. And he cuts off the ear of one of his enemies. And the rest of the disciples, and even Peter himself, denies Jesus, deserts Jesus, and they flee. Do you see this? Even his followers, they attack and they escape, but not Jesus. See, Jesus had every opportunity to avoid the cross, didn't he? He could have withdrawn. He could have slid out. He could have escaped. He also could have attacked. He could have called down the heavenly army. To destroy the Romans and the Pharisees and his accusers. But what does Jesus decide to do? He doesn't break peace. He doesn't fake peace. He makes peace. And he does it by his blood. See, real peacekeeping, it's always costly. It always involves sacrifice. And Jesus makes peace unlike an emperor, 
unlike a general, they made peace by the blood of their enemies. But Jesus gives his blood for his enemies. He says, I'm not here to kill my enemies. I'm here to be killed for my enemies. In Ephesians, it says, Jesus himself is our peace. So what does that mean, brothers and sisters? we got to be patient. Because every nation, every family, every business place, every individual, every heart, we're affected by sin. You know what comes with sin? Division, disagreement, and conflict. And as we wait for the peacemaker, as we wait for the Prince of Peace, we're never going to experience perfect peace. But here's the good news. Let's go to Isaiah 11. This is a prophecy describing the new heavens and new earth, the kingdom that the Prince of Peace will establish on this earth. Let me give you just one little snippet. It says this, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. The weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So you know this? This is one of the promises of the new heavens. When Christ brings heaven to earth, Shalom, that harmony, that blessedness, it will be restored. And it will be permanent. It will be eternal. And you see what this prophecy that Isaiah gives us? He's describing rivalries within the animal kingdom. Now, we think we know what real rivalry, rivalries look like in the southeast, right? Real rivalries are the Iron Bowl, right? Auburn and Alabama, War Eagle versus the Crimson Tide. We tend to think about sports rival, rivalries, UNC, Duke, and basketball, or Yankees, Red Sox, and baseball. But here's the thing, as contentious as those games can be sometimes, and look, there, there, there might be cursing and profanity and some shoving and some shouting matches, and fans might o- occasionally poison the trees of the other fan base, okay? But, but usually these games don't end in bloodshed, right? They don't become savage. They, they, they don't become, you know, just massacres. But here's the thing. You, you, you put a wolf and a lamb in the same sports bar, and what's going to happen? You put a cow and a bear in the same student section, what's going to happen? You put a fattened calf and a lion in the same stadium, what's going to happen? These are carnivores, apex predators. They're aggressive, and they're right next to peaceful, innocent, weak, and docile, docile animals. And guess what? There's perfect peace. Do you understand what Isaiah is saying? Okay, shalom, harmony completely restored. Let me leave you with one final image. You probably recognize this picture. It's pretty famous. This is from 1945. This is the cover of Life magazine. Have y'all seen this picture? It's pretty iconic. We've got a sailor and, he, and it, this, sharing this romantic kiss with a young nurse. Now, when you look at this picture, if you don't know the history, you tend to think what? These people love each other. Married, boyfriend, girlfriend, dating for a long time. They've probably got a history. They've got a long relationship. But did you know this? They were actually complete and total strangers. Do you know this? Because this picture is titled VJ Day in Times Square. VJ Day in Times Square. My historians know this, that VJ stands for what? Victory in Japan Day. This actually marks the end of World War II. And the point I'm trying to make is this. What would bring two total strangers together in closeness you could call this romantic peace and unity, sharing this embrace. Well, good news brought these two people together. Good news brings different people together. Well, brothers and sisters, we have even better news than BJ Day. We have the gospel. It's not just good news, it's the greatest news. And gospel means this, objective facts. This is not preference. It's as real as a headline. And the bad news of the gospel is this, is that we've sinned against our God. And so we've broken and invited disunity and hostility into our relationship with God, each other, and even ourselves. In other words, we're peace breakers. And sin divides and it separates, and yet Jesus unites and heals. And this is the good news of the gospel, is that Jesus brings us peace with God, peace with each other, and peace with ourselves. Because Jesus himself is our peace. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. Good news brings peace. Good news brings people together. Pray with me. 
Jesus, I pray that this would be a church that is marked by our love for each other. We recognize that even in the church, we lack peace. There can be conflict, disagreement, for sinful, divisive reasons. So, Lord, I pray that when people think about King's Chapel, it's not just the church on the hill, it's not just the church with great worship, but it's the church where people love each other, where people make peace, have costly, sacrificial conversations. Jesus, we thank you that you're the peacekeeper, you're the peacemaker. You do what no treaty, no alliance, no policy, no general, no president, no king can accomplish. You bring real, lasting, permanent, eternal peace to the whole universe. So Jesus, until you return, make permanent peace. May we be men and women. May we be a church that are peacemakers. Amen. I stand. Let's sing.